Now, when the characters come alive like that, you kind of know where the story is headed, but then the characters come alive. And yes, they do take the story in different directions. Some of the characters do that. They're perverse little creatures, and uh, they will throw you a curveball. Can you give us an example of where one of the characters stole the story and drove it in their own direction? Okay, well, in the first book, in A Game of Thrones, there was a crucial point where an assassin tries to kill Bran in his bed, and he's defeated, and they get this dagger, and it's a very unusual dagger. The Stark family by then has split, because Ned Stark has gone south with the king, and he's taken with him his two daughters, while Catelyn Stark, his wife, is still at Winterfell with her sons Rob and Bran and Rickon, and many of the family retainers. There's a scene where they meet, and my intention was that Catelyn would send a messenger with the dagger to Ned Stark in King's Landing to try to unroll this difficulty. But as I sat down to wrote this scene, Catelyn wouldn't do it. She wouldn't send a letter. You know, She was going to go herself. <laughs> you know, someone had tried to kill her child, and it was the dagger, and she wasn't going to... Yes, I'll write a very strong letter and send it off. Uh, <laughs> and I'll pick this minor character as a messenger. No, that was something that she was going to do herself. And that threw me for a bit of a loop because, you know, again, in my original thought, she was remaining at Winterfell, kind of as the ruler of the North. But some part of me knew the character better than the part that had done that initial plotting. I don't really believe in this mystical stuff you hear some author talk about. Where they, you know, we use it as a shorthand. We the characters talking to us, the characters saying things. It's really one part of your mind talking to another part of your mind. It's all coming from the author, but maybe it's a right brain, left brain kind of thing. But whatever is the creative part of the brain is not necessarily the analytical part, and it knows better sometimes. And uh, the analytical part may devise plots, but the creative part is the one that gives the heart and soul to the characters, and it overrules the analytical part sometimes. That conflict within the mind... That listening to other people in your head. I mean, you played off of that very well in a story ages ago, which my mind is now forgetting the title. A story of the person on a gateway, the guardian of the gateway. Uh, science fiction. Analog cover story? Yeah, yeah. That was one of my very earliest stories. The title was again? The Second Kind of Loneliness. Yes, yes. I totally forgot the title. But there you had a character who is playing off against the voices in his head. Mm -hmm. and dealing with that being on the edge of insanity. As a writer, does it make you nervous listening to people talk in your head? No, it makes me nervous to the idea that it may stop. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's interesting to see how writers go to hell. Of course, you always hope it won't happen to you, that you'll just get better and better until the day you die at 137. But, of course, it happens to most writers. Not all of them. There are writers like Jack Vance, who's one of my favorite writers, who I think is writing just as good as he ever was, and his stuff is terrific, and I buy every Vance novel and read it the minute it comes out. But They've just reprinted his Dying Earth series. Yes, wonderful. Which is, if people wonderful, read it. seminal fantasy series. The Dying Earth deserves to be mentioned, along with Middle Earth and Howard's Hyborian Age as one of the great settings of fantasy published in a very small edition in the early 50s by an obscure minor house called Hillman, and yet its effect on later fantasy is incalculable. Mm. But putting Vance aside as an exception, I do think many authors go to hell later in their lives, and the ones who are very analytical, rational things go to hell, their books become lifeless. You get the sense as you read each book that it's just like the book that came before, and that they're rewriting the same story over and over again. They're just going through the paces, you know. Mm. They've read too many stories about outlines of how to write a novel, and now they're doing it. On the other hand, the writers who have depended more on the creative part, perhaps who haven't been quite so analytical, what tends to happen to some of them is they just fall silent. Suddenly, someone who's been a very prolific writer stops writing, and you don't see any new books from them. I mean, you look at a writer like Theodore Sturgeon, tremendously prolific early in his career, and then suddenly he's taking 20 years to write his last novel, and it's still not complete when he dies. Or Walter M. Miller, you know, how many decades oh. did he work on the sequel okay. to Canticle for Leibowitz? and. Yeah. Finally, it had to be completed by another writer after his death. After he had committed suicide. Yes, yes. And from 
all reports that I've heard, there really wasn't much more to be done. There was only a little bit more to be done, and yet somehow he found himself unable to do it. So the fear is not of the voices in your head. The fear is that someday the voices will go silent. Uh, by then, you better hope you have a lot of good stocks and bonds. <laughs> <laughs> when you're starting a story, do you think of characters and situations? Do you think of a situation and find the characters to fit the situation? Do you come up with an image of something? Do you pose a question? I don't, I don't, by mind? the time I sit down, I, I know. I mean, the, the ideas come to you. They don't come to you sitting in front of the computer. They come to you. Where do they come to you? To all you. times, you know, when you're lying in bed, just before you go to sleep, and when you're riding on a train or in an airplane or when you're driving in traffic. Usually it's a time when you're alone in some sense. You may be surrounded by people, but you're alone. You're not engaged in conversation. And the ideas come to you. So hopefully you write them down. Sometimes you forget them if you don't write them down. And then when the uh, moment comes to work on them, you kind of take out your idea book or your notes and say, yeah, this one, I'll, I'll see what I can do with this one. In a book with multiple viewpoint characters, eight, nine viewpoint characters, and you've got all these story threads that are weaving in and out. Sometimes two threads will weave around each other and then separate, and you've got this tapestry that you're weaving. Do you sit down and write all eight, nine viewpoint characters simultaneously, or do you pick one and kind of follow that one through and then figure out where you're going to divide and mix everything together? I start off trying to write the chapters in the order in which they're going to be read, but it is true I don't often stick with that for very long. I usually get into a groove on a particular character, you know, Tyrion or Arya, whoever it may be, Jon Snow, and suddenly I start writing exclusively from the viewpoint of that character. I'll finish a Tyrion chapter, and the next chapter is supposed to be Bran or someone, but instead I'll skip ahead and do the next Tyrion chapter, and maybe skip ahead and do the next Tyrion chapter after that. <laughs> well, I've got to tell you, as a reader, when I'm really into a story and I'm really into what's happening to a character, I am known to flip ahead to read the next chapter for that character. Well, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> it's okay for me. It's not good for you. <laughs> well, I do it anyway. You're a reader. You're I supposed to follow, bad. read them in the order I give them to you. <laughs> I'm a bad reader. If your characters can change the direction of the story, I can change the direction of the read. Because things happen in between in the chapters of other characters that, that, that impact know. on, so you may find out things that you didn't want to know. That's um, happened. Yeah. <laughs> but sometimes you just can't help yourself. Also, of course, I find myself constantly rearranging the order of chapters. I mean, I start out with a kind of rough outline of, you know, how the chapters will fall. You want to try to come back to every character kind of semi-regularly, because otherwise the reader is likely to forget that they exist. But I discovered very early on in the process that you couldn't do it rigidly. Yeah. I started out in the first book. Initially, I had a structure. You know, I had like seven characters initially, and I was going to, you know, every seventh chapter and... Yeah. Uh, then it would always be the same order. Each character would have a chapter, seven chapters apart. It didn't work at all because sometimes one character is right in the midst of all the events and lots of things are happening to him, and another character is in a quiet portion of the story and not much is happening. And sometimes the chapters only cover a day, and sometimes they cover six months. So, you know, you really have to look at them hard and you have to vary the kind of approaches you take to them. I'm always juggling the chronology. You know, should I present the chapters in chronological order? Or the other question is, is for dramatic effect. I mean, sometimes cutting back and forth in certain ways, you get some interesting points and counterpoints. There's internal cliffhangers as well as the cliffhangers at the end of the books. Yeah. I frequently try to end a chapter on a cliffhanger yeah. or a chapter on a new development or a plot twist. Then you, know, you want some other chapters in between, so there is... Sometimes you can use the chapters in between just to let the reader have a breather. Oh, yes. Yeah, that happens, too. You want to avoid the second Indiana Jones phenomenon, where there were so many things piled on top of each other that after a while it's just like, poof, right. I don't care. Right. That, yeah, definitely. I enjoy when you've got a book like these where you've got a lot of characters, a lot of scope, and characters can go sometimes for a book without interacting. And then as the books move on toward a conclusion, certain characters suddenly start getting closer and closer to interacting, and it's 
Well, for the most part, all the characters were together when the first book began and have gone their separate ways. I said most, yeah. not all. There was always Daenerys, who was always off on a different continent, and they're spreading further and further apart, but of course, toward the end, some of they're them will be to coming together again, too. Now, do you find that adding a new viewpoint character makes it more enjoyable for you because it livens up the writing by having some new friend? Yeah, there's an element to that. It opens a new aspect to, to the thing. I, a viewpoint character gives you not only a new friend, but it gives you an entirely new way of looking, an entire new pair of eyes to look at your old friends, because the new viewpoint character has different knowledge and may have a different slant on many of the events that have gone before. So suddenly the reader, who has been told that a character is like this or something happened a particular way, here's a very different way of looking at things and has to step back and say, whoa, and maybe make a reappraisal, which... And think about it, which I like my readers to do, and my readers are great at doing this. I have some of the best and smartest best readers. Writing. Some of the websites that are set up and devoted to ice and fire, they keep amazing news groups and bulletin boards and things like that going, and they write me with questions that they've argued about and some pretty interesting discussions that they have there. They're very sharp, and they do think about it a lot, and I like that because... You want a readership who notices the subtleties that you're sweating to put into the book, and this is one way of getting at them. I mean, I'm a big believer in viewpoints. Uh, too many of us, as we read these books, believe everything that we're told by the author, and we shouldn't. We should, authors you know, lie. Well, authors lie, and the characters lie, and, and, and to the extent that you're inside a character's head, you have to realize that you're getting his point of view of what's going on. And the author should never lie in anything that's factual, where he's describing the world, saying the sun is coming up. Well, you don't say the sun is coming up if the sun is not coming up, but it's a pretty day. That's the character giving an opinion on it, you know? Mm -hmm. And it might not be such a pretty day to a different character. The Ice and Fire series has inspired incredible amounts of commentary in all manner of places. Yes, Great. <laughs> what is it about this series of yours that has inspired so much more discussion than other books that you've done? Well, I mean, compared with my other series, I think that the biggest difference is that it's an uh, ongoing, open-ended series. I mean, most of my previous novels have been single, standalone novels. So the reader reads them in one sitting or several sittings close together, and then they're over. When a work of art is complete, there's not much to discuss. You know, you know where it's going. You can't have arguments or discussions about this is where I think it's going or this is the kind of plot development that I want to see because, you know, you've read it. You know what's going to happen. It's already happened. A series that is still in the process of going on, I think, allows the readers to participate a lot more in that kind of having that kind of discussion. The only phenomenon that I've seen anything like what we're getting on on A Song of Ice and Fire previously that I was connected with was the Wildcard books, which were also an open-ended yeah. series. That was on a much smaller scale, of course, since those books did not have the huge audience that the Ice and Fire books are getting. But still, many Wildcard fans, and it was quite a popular series for a time, would have the same kinds of vigorous discussions about who their favorite characters were and who were good guys and who were bad guys and what should happen next and what they didn't want to happen next, etc., and we'd see that at conventions when we would do wildcard panels at conventions. Does the feedback from the readership while you're in the middle of an ongoing series, does that ever influence what you do with the series, the direction of it? You know, if somebody writes... Uh, no, no, it doesn't. It. I try not to let it anyway. I don't actually read the bulletin boards precisely because I know if I did read the bulletin boards, it might have an influence. It might have an influence both ways. I mean, what I read on the bulletin boards might influence the books, and my presence would inevitably influence the bulletin boards. Instead of the readers arguing with each other, it would all become sort of question for Mr. Martin sort of uh, thing where they were looking to me to answer questions or resolve things. I'd rather have them discuss it with each other than just make it a sort of a Internet question and answer. But I do get emails, of course, from the fans. So even without going into the bulletin boards, I hear some of what's going on from these emails. I do try not to let myself be influenced by that. Because I think you get in trouble if you do. I mean, like you set out with a book. For example, I'll give an example from the Ice and Fire series. The incident I mentioned already when we were talking about Catelyn, where 
an assassin is sent to kill Bran. And it's a mystery for most of the first two books. Who sent this assassin? And I know the fans had many, many discussions about this. And the answer to that is revealed in the third book. I, I solved that particular mystery. It's part of the closure of that book. But for the first two books, it was unresolved. So the readers were free to suspect this one or suspect that one and to make their arguments about who they thought did it. Now, inevitably, there are only to be generous, to be extremely generous, about a dozen likely suspects for this. <laughs> you know, maybe only okay. a half dozen who are at all logical and another half dozen who would be like extreme long shots. So when you have several hundred people discussing and arguing, inevitably, some of them are going to hit on the right answer. And maybe convince the others. And, you know, then you have a situation where everybody knows the right answer. Or at least you could get that impression if you were up on the board. So what do you do then as the author? Do you, do yeah. you change the answer? Because, gosh, they've all figured it out. Well, that's not going to be very good, you know. Well, you don't. You can't. If you're influenced by that, you're going to get very unsatisfying things. Because you've already laid the groundwork for the first answer. And it was that groundwork that led whoever figured it out to figure it out. And now if you start changing that... Uh, you know, you're changing the rules of the game in the middle, and you're also providing, I think, an unsatisfying artistic experience. Yeah. I've always thought, I, I, I mean, I've never met George Lucas. So I've never had a chance to actually sit down and talk with him about any of that. But I've always wondered whether Lucas wasn't affected by his audience to some extent. Because I think if you look at Star Wars, there are clearly things being set up by that suddenly changed abruptly in the later movies. I don't believe that he set out knowing that Luke and Leia were brother and sister. I think if you look at the first movie, they were clearly meant to be a love interest with each other. But the audience responded much more strongly to Han than to Luke. You know, that was part of it. And I don't think that Darth Vader was even originally Luke's father. I mean, uh, Obi-Wan clearly says in the first movie, uh, he killed your father. It doesn't seem to me it admits to any really double meaning. I think... Again, it was a case where Lucas, in between films, changed his mind, perhaps in response to the audience, and started deepening things. I think for a book or a film or any artistic endeavor like that to be satisfying, it's got to have a single author, a single vision. And as soon as the audience is guiding and directing what happens, you've lost the single artistic guidance, right? and you end up with, dear God, television which is surprising that it's as good as it is as often as it is considering what you have to do to do it. <laughs>